Okay, today's stuff we're going to be learning is Nazir Daflami, the Kodesh Tov to everybody. This month's learning is sponsored by Amy Cohen in memory of her father, Professor Dov Zlotnik, who taught his five girls the love of learning. We miss you. Today's stuff is sponsored by Leah Goldford on the first year outside of her father, Moshe Ben Meir, known as Mo. We miss your humor, your daily check-in calls, and mostly your amazing hugs. Still can't quite believe you're gone. We love you. Okay, we're going to get going with today's doc. We're going to finish the fourth chapter today. There's a study guide, so that will be useful. And um, for anyone who hasn't noticed yet, the um, there's one more class left of the skills class, which I'm teaching, which will end on Sunday. Anyone who missed it can always get it online. All the classes are available on t- uh, digitally. And the b- Complete Beginner's Guide to Gemara Part 2 of Le- Rabbanit Lea Sarna is going to be starting the Sunday after that. So the first three Sundays in March. Um, please register. Note that because of time change in different countries, some yes, some no. So the time is going to go by um, time in America and North America. And when it changes in England and Israel, so note that the time will be different between weeks one and then weeks two and three will be a different time. Um, it was a little complicated to handle that. So just so you please pay close attention to the timing. Okay, the problems and the struggles of global uh, shearing. Maybe one day they'll all change clocks at the same time. We won't have these issues. Okay, we're going to get started with our DAF now. We were in the middle of a section. So let's just do a very, very quick review of what we saw yesterday. We had an Ishmadilik Benoah father can make his son into a Nazir, but a woman cannot make her daughter into a uh, not make her son into a Nazir. And a father can't make his daughter into a Nazir. It's just father's son. Um, and then we said, why is that? Rabbi Yochanan said, Rish Lakish said, it's because of the mitzvah of Pinuch. It's in order to train his son. And then we had to figure out why it doesn't relate to women, not mothers and not daughters. Then we tried to suggest that the machloket, Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish, I'm now moving quickly to Kavtetim Abet, was based on the machloket Tanaim, between Rabbi and Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, who had a whole debate about it. Until what age can the father do it? Is it until the son? reaches maturity on a Torah level, two salavot, has two pubic, pubic hairs, reaches maturity, or is it what we call until the time where a child neder is valid? I made a small mistake yesterday, which as I said, it's on the bookmarks for Nazir, but they're actually on the bookmarks for Nadarim, because it's really a halacha in Nadarim, that when you get to the age of 12, most of the commentaries say, it's at the age of 12, you're already mature enough to understand your, your neder. If you take a neder, if the rabbis kind of check, do you really understand the, like what you're doing? And if you do, which is interesting because usually when nederim, we say often you can get rid of your neder because you didn't really understand and even a grown-up doesn't necessarily fully understand the ramifications. But if you understand the concept, I'm taking a neder, then basically your neder is valid. Now that's a rabbinic law. It's important to distinguish. Torah laws, you reach maturity at two salvo. And that's when Rebbe says, that's when the salacha kicks in. The, you know, until this point, the father can still make a vow for the son. Rebbe yes, Rebbe says, no, as soon as the son can make his own vow, even if it's only valid on a rabbinic level, that's enough. Then we said, maybe the machloket is actually based in another machloket. And that's after we, I forgot to finish that, which is we tried to say Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish are arguing about the exact same issue here as their debate is the same basis, which we rejected and said, no, there's nothing to do with it. Okay, really not connected at all. But we did say that there's this Tanaitic source from Rabbi Hanina. It was a case where he came forward and his father had made a vow for him. And they went to check what they want to check. Well, that was the big debate. Were they checking he had two salvo? Or were they checking that he reached the age of 12? So when they went to check, Rabbi Hanina says, it doesn't matter, don't bother checking me. Either I'll be a Nazir because I can bring the Zirut upon myself because I'm old enough, or my father. In other words, any which way I'm a Nazir, you don't need to check me. So then we, su- we saw that this really was the same Mechloket because each one said, Rabbi Gamliel said they were checking, did he have two salvo? And Rabbi Yossi said they were checking if he had reached the age of 12 or not. To which the Gemara had ended with this question. This the mother, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, I'm now five lines from the bottom of Kaptadim of Bek, because we're answering this question. I want to just review it inside. Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda, makes sense. Because I knew to come out in Katanani, a Yebishvilab, and in Gadolani, a Yebishvilab, it's me. He said, if I'm too young, then I'll be on account of my father's vow. If I'm old enough, now old enough and too young sounds like age. If I've 
at that age, which would be 12. So therefore, it makes sense according to Rabbi Yosef Rabbi Yuna, but Ela L'Revi, Damar, Ad Shebish Tesaro, Bim Gadol, and the Ebesh Filatzmi, Habad Hashem Tedevo How could he say, if I'm old enough, meaning if I reach the age of 12, I'll be because of my own sake, but he can't be because he's still, according to the opinion of Rebbe, he's still in the domain of his father until he has two pubic hairs. So how do we explain this? They get rid of the words im gadol im katan. And it's they, you, know, you could have just explained gadol katan means I've reached maturity. I haven't reached maturity. And it doesn't mean age. It means some sort of outside uh, sign. But the Gemara, it, maybe that's what they, maybe they're saying that's what it means, okay? But what he basically, they say is get rid of katan gadol. It doesn't mean age. It means basically either which way, what, whether I reach maturity, have a reach maturity, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be an Azir anyway, but then the issue isn't age specifically, like on, you know, to the date and what was my age, it's more have I reached maturity. You can then explain it according to Rebbe as well. Now the Gemara has another question according to Rebbe. We understand now if he had already had two Sarot before this vow took place, remember the father, took the vow, and then Rabbi Hanina says, whether his is valid or not, I'm taking it on myself, right, in the event that his is not. So we have this acceptance of Nizirut at a given moment of time. If that moment of time was, he had already seen two Sarot before that statement was made, then he reached maturity, then obviously he's a Nazir on his own. Ulev self, what if he had two, two hairs, at the end, meaning on the day he finished the 30 days that he spent as a Nasir, then he reaches maturity. Then also, then it's obvious, well, not also, I should say, that the first one was obvious he's going to be a Nasir on his own account. This one will be obvious he was a Nasir on his father's account because he, all his days he completed as a minor. But, what if he reached maturity? smack in the middle, or any time within the 30 days. Now we have a question, but the question's only going to be according to Rebbe. And this has to do with the Torah rabbinic law, and you'll see why in a minute. For him, it makes perfect sense, and the Gemara doesn't explain why. But the commentaries say that the issue is this. If you've reached the age of 12, by Torah law, you're still in your father's domain. It's just the rabbis have said, we're going to treat you like a grown-up as far as this issue is concerned. But if that happens in the middle of your nizirut, of your father's, on a Torah level, your father accepted you to be a nazir. So you're a nazir based on your father's. It doesn't matter that you reach this age of maturity, the age of 12, in the middle of that whole thing. But el el rebi, damar ad shevishte saro, According to rebi, we're going to have an issue. Because if you've reached halachic maturity by Torah law in the middle, okay, now, you have a problem. Because when you do the shaving at the end, um, what are you doing? He said, either I'm mature and I'll be on my own account or I'm not mature, I'll be on my father's. But now he's kind of both because he accepted this as he would upon himself saying, if I reach the age of maturity, I'll be a Nazir on my own. And he reached the age of maturity in the middle. So now the problem is, which one is he? Is he a Nazir on account of his father? Because that's what he was at the stat. That was his status. He was a minor at the beginning. But now in the middle, he becomes... Mature, maybe he has to do Nizirut on his own. So it's a big deliberation to which they say, Amre, le Rebbe, le Katakanta, there's no way to resolve this until at the Yatib delay, the Yatib Gavue. Because of this doubt, he basically needs to wait 30 days for his father's Nizirut and then keep another extra 30 days of his own Nizirut. And then that will fulfill all the doubts. And then he can bring the sacrifices at the end of the whole process. Because it could be that you can't bring it after the first 30 days because part of those days he was really for his father and part of those he was for himself and that they wouldn't, they wouldn't go together. He would either need 30 days of his, his own acceptance or 30 days of his father's acceptance and we don't know which one. So basically we're going to make him keep 60. That's what the Gemara says here. That's their answer. With that, we move on to the next mission. Ha'ish megalech al nizirut aviv, another distinction between men and women. A, a man can take upon himself the sacrifices of his fathers. Okay, now here we're talking, we already learned this, that if, now we're going to have a whole deliberation, but 
Till now, we've learned that if the father was a Nasir and then died, and then the son says, you know what? And, and the father talked about had separated money, not animals, animals he can't use. But if it was money that the father separated and there were unspecified funds as to which one was going to which sacrifice, then the son can take that money and say, listen, I'm going to be a Nasir. I want to finish what my father didn't get to do in his life. I'm going to buy sacrifices with it and I'll be a Nazir and use this money that my father, that I inherited from my father, so to speak, to fulfill my obligation and bring my sacrifices when I'm finished. So he can do that. But a woman is not allowed to do that. And I have to see why a woman can't do this. Kate said, how does this work? And interestingly, they're going to first say how it doesn't work, and then they're going to say how it does work. But there's a bit of a major problem with the Nusach here, okay? There's two different versions that are opposite. Okay, so I'm going to read the way it appears in the text here, which is the way the Mefarish, which is the commentary that appears as Rashi here on the page. But I'm going to then read you the way the Rosh reads it, which is going to match better with the Gemara and the continuation. Ketzad, how does this work? Mishaya Aviv Nazir, his father was a Nazir. And he separated unspecified funds for his Nazirut. And then he died. That was the case I just brought you. And then the son says, I'm going to be a Nazir and I will do the shaving, which really means the sacrifices using the money of my father. Now, notice this is Rabbi Yossi's opinion. We don't get anyone else's opinion in the Mishnah. The Gemara is going to say, does anyone disagree with him? But we'll get to that later. The money all goes to voluntary sacrifices. The son cannot use it for this. This is not the case. So even though we said this, the son can do, and they said, how? Well, first they tell you, this is not the case where he can do it. But when does it work? If he and his father were Nazirim together, and then his father separated money and then died, then the son can do it. The logic of this reading is that if they were together as Nazirim, then there was a connection between their Nazirim. And therefore, if the father dies, the son can use the father's money. But if this, and you could even say theoretically, maybe the father had an inkling that maybe he would die and was thinking of his son already when he did, when he put the money aside. But if the, the father was a Nazir and then the son becomes a Nazir after his death, there's no connection and therefore it doesn't work. That's the version that the Mefarish has. But many of the other commentaries, the Rosh and many others, reverse the Nusa and say, no, 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 it's the exact opposite. It's specifically, and that's how I explained it before, because I explained based on the majority of the commentaries, which is, it's the reverse. Specifically, when the father was a Nazir, separated his money, then died, and the son wants to kind of, right, first of all, he inherits this money, and he wants to fulfill the Nazir his father didn't get to do, then it works. But if he and his father were Nazir together, then they already had these two separate Nazir and you can't take the money from one and put it into the other. Okay, and that's, again, the more accepted version, even though it's not the printed version. I read the printed version first because it's the printed version, but just because the one that got printed doesn't mean it's a better version. Okay, you'll see in the Gemara on the next page, Rabbi Yossi appears to be quoted in a brighter with the exact opposite of what appears in the printed edition on this side of the page. So on the opposite side, it's going to read that way. So again, we can go with, to make things simpler, just I wanted you to know there's two versions. I put them both on the sheet in a chart so you could see. But basically what Rabbi Yossi says in, in a nutshell, before we even get into the different versions, there's one situation where it works, there's one situation where it doesn't work. And according to the one we'll stick with, it works if the son takes on the Nizirut after the death of the father, and it doesn't work if they were Nizirut together. The ramifications of these two versions is not really so relevant in the end, because in the end, we're going to say the rabbis disagree with him, and we'll see how they disagree, and therefore... Whatever Rabbi Yossi says in the end, halakha lama says, we say, you know, it is important to know the different opinions, but his opinion is anyway rejected because the majority of rabbis disagree with him and therefore there's no practical ramifications of which one we go with. The first thing the Gemara does though, before we get there is my timer. What's the reason they want to go back to the first line? A son can do it, but not a daughter. 
my time, huh? You ready for this? Probably guess what it's going to say. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, halacha hi benazir. Rabbi Yochanan says, as we keep seeing, this is a halach l'mash misina. It's an old tradition. To which the Gemara says, pshita. This is obvious. Why do you need a halach l'mash misina, Rabbi Yochanan? This is just clear. Why? This all works based on laws of inheritance. The father designated money, but it was still within his estate. The son inherits the estate, right? What are you trying to tell us? Simple, basic Torah law. The son inherits the father and the daughter doesn't. That's why the daughter can't take this money. It's not hers to take. It goes to her brothers, the money. So she can't take it and say, I'm using this for my nizirut. And really the main issue today is going to be, does this have anything to do with laws of inheritance or not at all or partial? It's going to be a big deliberation. To which the Gemara answers, Lutzricha, no, you need it for what case? Delele Elabat. Yes, it's true that in 98% of the cases, or I don't know what the percentage is, maybe 90% or 80%, I don't know what, what statistics show, but in most situations, you're going to have the situation where the daughter's not going to inherit. But in a case, Delele Elabat, but in a case where he only has a daughter, Mao de Tema Yorshin Gemirana, you might have thought, this all is based on laws of inheritance. So if the daughter is the sole inheritor, then maybe she can, right? So there are certain situations where people have no, no sons, they only have daughters. And then the daughters will inherit. And then maybe you would think that the daughter could use this money. That's why Rabbi Yochanan comes to tell you, we're now in Amud Bet, Halacha. The Halacha is, right? This is the Halacha, this is a tradition and it's only men and it's not women. And it's not daughters and there's nothing or maybe it has something to do with inheritance, but in a case where the daughter will inherit, she can't do this, okay? Again, once you say, there's no questions asked. We don't know why. It's just the way the tradition was passed down. Now they ask a question. This is a question I said we were going to get to before. Do the rabbis disagree with Rabbi Yossi or do they not disagree with him? And and if you want to say, we see this imtim salom a number of times today, it's so always asked when they ask a question and they want to ask a question within the question, it's like a flow chart. If you go this way in the flow chart and you want to say they do disagree, Aresha or Asefa. Do they disagree about the case where Rabbi Yossi said this doesn't work and they say it works, which in simpler terms just means the rabbis think it works in both scenarios? Or do they disagree on the second case where Rabbi Yossi said this is a case where the son can do it and the rabbis hold you can't do it in that case either? To which they bring a source, a writer, which says, Tashma, let's learn from here. So this is the writer where I said we're going to see the other opposite version of what it says in our Mishnah, in the printed text of our Mishnah, but not in the, you know, necessarily in the manuscripts. How do we know that in what case, sorry, does the does the son able to use his father's money? Okay, so now they start with the way you would have expected. When does it work? And then they're going to go to when doesn't it work? This, by the way, I'll tell you right now, we're reading Rabbi Yossi's opinion right now. So if his father was a Nazir and, uh, and his father separated out money and then he died, and then Amal, the son says, I'm going to be a Nazir using the money of my father when I get time to the sacrifices. That's the case that works. Ava, but if he and his father were Nazirim, if they were Nazirim together and the father died, that money that the father designated is going to have to go to voluntary offerings. The son cannot use it. So far, we haven't seen the rabbis, but here comes the second opinion in this bright town. Rabbi Yezel, the Rabbi Meir, the Rabbi Yehuda, which is already more of a majority than just one Rabbi Yossi, Amru, Zehu Shemagaleh Hamaot Aviv. Say, this case, you can also be Megaleh Hamaot Aviv. So you see that they disagree and they permit it in both cases. Now, by Rabbi, we now have from now till the end of the chapter, the end of our daf, because we're not going to read the first line of the next Mishnah. We'll start that tomorrow, which is at the very bottom of our page. But we're going to have a slew of questions. Questions that are going to end in a take unanswered questions. And this is going to be what I mentioned before, that we're trying to deliberate between how much, even if we say it's halachanamoshmi sinai, 
does it have something to do with inheritance laws? Does it work in the way that inheritance works? Even if let's say we exclude the daughters, okay? But within the sons, does it work? Does it have similar rules to inheritance? And we'll see all sorts of ones or not. And then we're gonna have some other questions about this mechanism. Bye, Rabbi. Rabbi asks, Yesh What if two of his sons became nizirim? What do we say? Hilchet agemir called the kadim galach hilach. And anyone, we say, it's Allah HaMash Sinai. First come, first serve, as we say. Whoever does finishes first and, you know, use it or claims, takes claim to the money first, gets it. It's one son and winner takes all. Or, or is this tradition within the laws of basic inheritance, which would mean that if two sons of his became a Nazir, then they split a 50-50, right? You can imagine the scene. If it's the case where the father dies, you know, the sons are dying to be Nazirim so they can use their father's money, you know, any way to get some extra money from the inheritance. And then, they, you know, they end up becoming Nazirim. It seems a little strange. Right? That you have these two sons who both are dying to be the Nazir. So the question is, do we split a 50-50? Do they each get half the money or no? Does it all go to one of them? And then it seems similar to these halachot of kol alim gviyu, whoever's the strongest wins. You know, whoever kind of does it first, it's his. By Rafa. Rava now asks. So the first was Rava. Now we have Rava. What if you have a firstborn and a non-firstborn son? Now, generally, before I even read, explain this, a Bechor gets double the share. So if we have two sons, the Bechor is going to get two thirds and the non-Bechor, non-firstborn is going to get a third because he basically gets, it's basically viewed as if there's three portions and the Bechor gets two of them and the other one gets only one. Obviously, it would be different with this book, right? You would calculate it based on if there were three, you'd split it into four. The Bechor would get half and the other two would split the other half. So they ask a good question. Do we say, and therefore, he doesn't get the portion, the double portion of the father's money he set aside for the sacrifice. Or do we view this as regular laws of inheritance? And if so, the same way he would get Pishnaim and all the other of the father's property, he would also get double portion here of the sacrifice money. I told you we'd see this term again. And if you want to say, if you go along that track of saying it's inheritance, and then he's going to basically get the portion of the sacrifice, the double portion, would you say, though, maybe not in this case? Now we're going to have two options. Do you say the Pishnaim is only in possessions the father owns that aren't sanctified? This is sanctified because it was sanctified for a sacrifice. And maybe he doesn't get double portion of a sanctified because theoretically anything that's sanctified really belongs to the temple. It doesn't, or to God. It doesn't really belong to the father. So it's true it's going to be given as sacrifice, you know, but, but it's in the father's property right now. But maybe the double portion doesn't apply to anything the father had that was hectic. Oh, Dilma, or maybe you say no. This, it's true, it's hectic, but it's a hectic that basically can be acquired by one of the sons. So maybe it does have laws of regular inheritance, and maybe he would get the double portion. We end all those questions without an answer. You'll see in a minute, or in two minutes, we'll get to the end, and we'll see Teku where they don't have any answers. Now we're going to move to a different set of questions about this. So that was all questions. Do we view this as part of inheritance in some sort of way in the sense that the kids split it? And if they do split it, then do they split it as behold and the firstborn gets two, a double portion or not really, okay? And maybe this wouldn't apply. Maybe it wouldn't apply. Maybe it would apply in general, but not to this because it's hectic, right? So a lot of questions. Now they ask two other types of questions, which is, Aviv nizir olam behun nizir stam. What if the father was in his year forever? Now, if you remember, in his year forever means every 12 months, by the way, we're talking about the bookmarks. This is in your bookmark on Nazir. Every, if, in case you forget these terms, every 12 months, you can, you know, if your hair is too long, you can sh shave and bring the sacrifices. So the father set aside for his sacrifices for 12 months, and then he died before the 12 month period came up. And then the son said, I want to be a Nazir like my father, but not fully like my father. I want to be a Nazir Stam. I want to be just for 30 days. I don't want to be a Nazir forever. Or the reverse. Aviv Nazir Stam, he was just a 30-day Nazir. 
But when the son took upon himself, he was in Nazir Olam. Who in Nazir Olam? He became a Nazir forever. Now, it seems like the question is, but in a second, we're going to see it's not exactly, that there are different levels, right? One is one type of Nazir and one is the other. But the real question is going to be, maybe this halacha of the son being able to get the money from the father only applies in Stam Nizilut. So the question would even be, and the commentaries say, some of the commentaries say, it's as if they asked this question, they were just shortening it. They just said it in short. But they also mean, and you'll see in a minute why it's clear that they mean that, if the son was a, if the father was in Nizir Olam forever, and the son took upon to be in Nizir Olam, also you would ask this question. Why? Because listen, when they, they did, when they specify exactly what the question is, they explain, is this halacha l'moshi misina that was passed down that the son can take on the father's sacrifices? Was it only in a case of regular nizirut? Or was it also in a case of a nizir olam, a one who's a nizir forever? So that's why it would even include a case where they're not different levels. They could be the same level, but it's nizir olam, and maybe it just doesn't apply when you have a nizir olam. Again, we don't have an answer. V'intim tzeloma. Now, if you want to say that we're assuming the case was, and this is what we assumed all along, the father separated sacrifices as he was finishing his term of Nizibu. The son also now wants to use the money for the end of his Nizibu. That's called Nizibu Tahara. But by Rav Ashi, Rav Ashi asked the following question. Aviv Nizir Tameh, let's say the father had become impure while he was in Nazir, and the money that we're discussing here right now was the money he separated for his sacrifices when he became impure to a dead body, which are not the same sacrifices as the ones when you finish your nizibu. And you can see where the question's going. V'hu nazir tahol. And the son wants to use them to complete a nazir term and bring three different sacrifices. Now again, you could say it was ma'ot stumim. It was just money set aside for sacrifices having to do with nizibu. What's the difference? It was pure, one was impure, one was for pure. Or the reverse case. Aviv Nazir Tahor, Behu Nazir Tameh. The father took on Nizihut and was going to complete it and put the money aside for the completion. And the son took upon Nizihut and then became impure and wants to use this money for the first three sacrifices he needs to bring, the ones for impurity. My, what's the halacha? And the Gemara answers, as I already told you, with Teku. We don't have answers to any of these questions. And with that, Hadranath Misha Amar, if you remember, we said it's Misha Amar Bakla, it's the second Misha Amar chapter. With that, we finished the fourth chapter. So a quick review of today's doc. We saw, we started with this machloka we saw of Rabban Gamliel and um, Rabbi Yossi. And then we tried to connect it to, we said, we did connect it, that was already yesterday, to the machloka between Rabbi and Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Yehuda. And then we said that there's something in the language that doesn't seem to match very well with Rabbi. And then we asked a further, and then we explained it. Then we asked a further question on Rebbe. What would happen if he became of age right in the middle? And then we said he would have to take on two Nizirut, right? Before he could bring sacrifices, he would have to be a Nazir 30 days on account of his father, 30 days on account of himself. Then we, and that was Rabbi Hanina specifically because of the way he said what he said. Then we brought this Mishnah about the son being able to take upon the Nizirut of the father. We saw two different versions in the Mishnah. We saw that it was a son and only not a daughter. We asked, Rabbi Yochanan said, it's halacha mosh misinai, to which we said, why do you need that? Isn't it basic laws of inheritance? To which they say, no, this overrides. If the daughter were to inherit, she still couldn't do this halacha. Then we asked, do the rabbis disagree with Rabbi Yossi? Because we only saw Rabbi Yossi's opinion. We said they do. And in fact, they seem to say it's permitted across the board. Both cases would work. Again, whatever version you have of Rabbi Yossi, which case works, which case doesn't work, they think both cases work. And then we had a number of questions that we didn't have an answer to, which is, Number one, how much do these laws have laws of inheritance mixed in? Would sons be able to split? Because the mission only talked about one son taking on the Nizirut of his father. What if there's multiple sons? What if there's a Bechor who wants to do it, the firstborn? And then we had, um, what about, is it only Stam Nizirut, or is it, which is 30 days, or is it also for someone who is, is in Nizir Olam? who, by the way, his whole sacrifice is the same technical, but it's really kind of different because he's not finishing his Nizilut. So you could think that maybe there would be a difference. And we have the final question, which is, what about if one set was for a Nazir Tameh and one set was for a Nazir Tahul? Could you use the money from one and move it to the other? And with that, we finish the chapter. Wishing everyone a Chodesh Tov and a great day.